Alrighty people, as promised we're reaching 2,000 subscribers, today we'll be ranking every ultimate jutsu from Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm. Why won't you come back to the village with us? I just want to thank you guys again for all the love and support you've shown me over the years. Also yes, this is indeed all jutsu from every form of every character, so expect some wild shit. Alright, let's just get this going with the worst ultimate jutsu in the game. God, this one is just piddly. I'm legit not even trying to dunk on Choji in part 1. This move is just terrible. I guess the best way to describe it is that it just sorta of happens? Choji uses super expansion jutsu, and I guess he grinds the opponent underneath him? There's just nothing here. Minimal impact, no finish, and zero creativity. I think it's lack of a finish that does it the most for me. I'm still pissed butterfly form didn't make it to the game, but to give this to Choji? Man, I thought Tsunade was done dirty by Cyber Connect 2, but Choji's got pretty bad too. I want you guys to know in advance, it really does pain me to have Kimiwa with this low. This carries a trend of Naruto games to the mid-2000s of trying to be too accurate to the show, and this carries that to a T. The worst part is that there's nothing particularly wrong here. It's also just kind of symptomatic of how short Kimimaro was on the screen in this form. It's a shame too, because Kishimaru Kimimaro is one of the most powerful characters in the game. You just wouldn't get that with this attack. I will say the bones fragmenting is pretty cool at least. So really old Sarah Palin jokes aside, The real reason why Eno makes this list is due to her showing off her skills needed to run for governor of Alaska. God, how old am I again? There's nothing particularly wrong about this one. The spinning and flower petal effects are nice, and how the flowers bend towards the opponent is neat, but there's not a whole lot going on here besides that. Frankly, my two favorite parts are the kick of the face and the flower lodging itself in the enemy's head. Kinda cool, but remembering how little Eno does in the show, you see how much reaching they do with this jutsu. No, this wasn't done on purpose with putting Eno and Sakura this low on the list together. This attack does bring some impact and creativity into it, but the fact that we took a gag for Sakura and turned into an ultimate attack kinda cuts away from the impact a little. If I can propose one way this attack is pretty great, Sakura summons her stand the forehead. <laughs> Let me get this straight. Kisami's great sword turns into a drill, which turns into a whirlpool. Yuzora lost me at the drill part, but if I can say anything, water style users were nearly non existent at the start of the show, and objectively still are, so I can cut Namco a bit of slack. But like, don't you think we could have had a bit more brutality with Samihara and shredding the opponent up? Hell, even Clash Ninja does this perfectly. I don't really want to hate this move, but like Kimimaro, this attack is too accurate to the show. I know, weird complaint, but bear with me on this one. 
The creepy organ does sell the atmosphere of Reaper Death Seal. The effects are top notch for a 2008 PS3, and the slow mo also does this move wonders. But aside from that, yeah, again, this attack just sort of ends. The Reaper's hand reaching for the bad touch is cool as hell, though, I will admit. Here I go. You have to keep an ace up your sleeve. No matter how puny a bug you are, I won't underestimate you. Well, it's no spirit bomb made out of bugs, but hey, this one's okay. The physical shot of Shino in the middle of the Twister is really the highlight here, but I want to mention something. What even is this attack's conclusion? Shino grips a chunk of the wall, and struggling to hold it sells the speed of the Cyclone, but what even happens here? Some wave or something rides up the wall, hits the opponent, and the Twister just explodes. This Jutsu is not bad, but it's a lot better than could have done even at this point in time. I'm officially going to say we're out of bad territory, but we aren't really in good either. Using the attack that took out Tuya was a good call, and selected the Tornado Blades and half is not to scoff at. Maybe it's just me though, but this whole sequence just feels too short. I know Tamari's never been one for flashing and destructive moves, but when uses really need some love around here. This is just... I don't know where to start. Alright, obviously this is taken from after he lost his arms to Hiruzen, and they worked with what they had. But this is taken from an Orochimaru who had no jutsu besides summon a lot of snakes because I am snake. Tasty. If you must know why this is so low on the list, uh, check out this one jutsu of his from in the older Ultimate Ninja games. And yeah, just leave it at that. Now, let's begin. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's the return of the onesie. Fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with this ultimate jutsu, but if you compare it to the other version, it just doesn't hold up. This is one of the attacks that lost some of its impact come its reintroduction and generations, but hey, at least the lighting and explosion are cool, I guess. Okay, this slot is actually two jutsu, but this one first. In terms of giving the boy his ultimate jutsu that sets the barometer for the rest of these, it's pretty good. The sheer amount of clones does a good job of portraying the attack skill, and that swing at the end? I don't even think this is impossible to do, but getting to see one frame of your opponent's face is great. Also, the clones from a distance are super low res. That's a, that's a fun little catch. Now for the other version. If Naruto is wearing PJs, his clones are sleeping the whole time. A dog pile with a bunch of sleeping clones and not waking up for anything definitely gets this move a good rank. I will do my best now. Alright, we are officially in good territory. Lee's ultimate jutsu, you know, the one that isn't the one everybody thinks about, is absolutely good. Lee seems like he's been out of jello for large parts of this attack, and his personality shines through perfectly here. But the real reason this is here is that fucking spinning headbutt. Why is that even a spinning attack? 
So I was probably going to point out to a filler episode where it does, but trust me, I'm, I'm being facetious. This shit is gold. Right, so for the other one of my boys, we have Gara doing Giant Sand Burial. This move is so perfectly balanced with a lot of attributes that make these attacks good. Scale, impact, accuracy, the opponent's reaction shot, it's all here really. This one's not really held back by any of its own faults, but more so just a higher up spots being that much better. Still, being able to render this shit on a console in 2008, pretty good. Can you endure this? If I can give CC2 credit for anything, it's resisting the urge to give Kaba to a giant chakra dissection blade. However, for them to go in the direction of Night and Living Dead, and to expand on the gimmick juice that he used one time, alright, you got me. It takes balls. Only thing here is, again, there's no finisher. The opponent just drops out after being mauled by zombies for a bit. Can't deny that raw creativity to do this one, though. Crushing the enemy on a rock so hard it explodes. That alone is pretty brutal, but the fact that Shikamaru is doing it off a move not even meant to do that is pretty impressive. It even keeps him grabbing the opponent using shadow possession at the start. Visually though, is where this move really shines. How in the hell did this game engine even draw all these lines? If I can't do a hundred push-ups in five seconds, cross that dance time! <laughs> Don't lose to yourself. <laughs> Victory! Leap style youth exercise! Oh god, this move just radiates charisma. Well, for a man who nearly killed Tentail's Mother by punching him really hard, I'm not too shocked. I like how I just said that. Anyway, being able to turn a hardcore self-workout that would make Saitama blush into a brutal beatdown and squeeze dynamic, yeah. finisher like that is a wonder on the eyes. I know, for Kiba to make it up this far in any capacity is amazing. The attack itself is pretty brutal and moves out at high speed, but the real reason that's so high up? Look at these camera movements. Kiba's practically doing donuts around the entire stage to land this move. And I think I can hear my PS3 choking from the idea of trying to process this. Yeah, I'm a man of substance. This shit's only halfway up the list. It's incredibly disrespectful. Scaring the opponent thousands of times over using blades of various sizes is pretty cool. And for all of them to come crashing down on them is a very nice cherry on top. However, that being said, there's not much flair in here or charm beyond that. While it's certainly a spectacle, brutality for sake of brutality in a Naruto game needs a bit more dimension to it. Then again, this is Tenten, whose fight against Tamari and the manga demon happened on screen, so... Might explain that. I could do it too. Gotta give Best Girl credit, she can pull on one hell of a laser show. Everything about her movements wrapping up through the attack are so smooth and elegant. 
Cyber Connect 2 managed to capture a gentle fist movements perfectly. Oh yeah, and then there's the goddamn laser berry that shreds the opponent followed by the downward palm thrust. Leaving to Hinata the transition from destructive to cute in a matter of seconds. This is where I shine. If I could describe Conqueror's ultimate jutsu in any one way, it's underrated. There's not too much flash going on here, but every strike has such a fun punctuation that rides off that alone. Damn shame we didn't get that close-up shot from the old Ultimate Ninja games. But hey, deciding to detonate and at the last second isn't a bad trade-off. Also, can we talk about how the opponent's getting punctured with every one of those blades? Kisame could take some notes here. <laughs> okay, I know it seems weird to have a slightly different version of the same move be 11 whole slots higher than the last one, but this just works. For one, purple Chidori's just don't exist in the show itself that I know of, and hasn't been utilized once since, again, Ultimate Ninja. Gonna admit to being a little nostalgia biased here, but that purple is so unique and striking it just fits. Alt is the only time in any game you see Sasuke with a half activated curse mark level 2. It definitely explains a weird sneer from before, with Sasuke having just impaled Naruto from the Vile Valley. For this version's sheer uniqueness, you might be able to see why it's so much higher up the list than the bog standard Chidori. And that same creativity is what propels this several entries up higher in the list too. If Jericho is looking for uniqueness, then why are two common attacks this high up the list? To be honest, it's partly because of the source material. Neither of these attacks show what they do when they make contact, so for CC2 to attach unique effects for each one, that's worthy of praise. Sasuke's especially is noteworthy for not just being a Chidori slice and having ominous music accompanying it. Naruto having his eye slit pulsate, having this detailed charging animation, and the Rasengan going boom is a great touch. At least the two forlorn lovers have pretty beefy attacks to themselves. Here I go. The final blow. Pathetic. Yeah, you're seeing this right. Kibumaro's base form is on the exact opposite end of the list from his curse mark form. This juju just encompasses more or less everything he did in the show. The finger bullets, the high speed bone slashing, and the sprouting ribcage bones, albeit slightly more than usual. That high speed spinning is especially getting bonus points with me. Even starting off with the light step bouncing is a nice touch. May the objective best part of this arc go out knowing he has one of the coolest looking jutsu and one of the best looking Naruto games. Okay, so before we get to number 7, this countdown was originally 31 entries, but I compressed it to 30 by squeezing this one to a 7.5. It's not much different from this original version, but I like the difference too much. I could do it too. <laughs> Take everything I said about her 64 palms guard, apply it here, and now add the single cutest animation any single Naruto game has ever done. I could sit here and defend my decision to do this, but I'm opting to move on instead. Although this still makes me smile every time I see it. Lightning 
Double Lighty Quake somehow manages to squeeze in style and fucking lore into one spot. For those not familiar, the reason Kakashi's Chidori is called Lightning Blade is because it's said to have split a lightning bolt in half once. I still don't know where that happens in the show, by the way. Considering these dudes derived an entire ultimate juju around that myth, and tapped into every 13 year old's fancy of seeing someone use two single hand attacks, I think Kakashi secures this spot no problem. Man could squeeze into a Devil May Cry game with something like this. I'ma be real, Chief. This attack would be the last time CC2 shows Tsunade any semblance of love. For as simple as his attack is, the energy captured with the enemy being tossed like a ragdoll and his screen shake of the impacts knocks is up to a 10 for me. Also, bonus points for me with the cute look on her face and the small bounce to her chest. And then Tsunade would go on to be a boring office lady who would be stuck with the same blend ultimate jutsu from Storm 2 up to Storm 4. Go check for yourself! It's still there, and it never once gave her a new moveset or new tools. <sighs> I miss the old badass grandma. What's that? Yeah. Only number 5, but no less deserving of being in top spots. The wildest thing about this is how close Hidden Lotus is to the one in the show, save for a few different camera angles. It's interesting seeing how much this contrasts with other attacks on this list that are close recreations to how they're done in the anime. However, for Lee, Hidden Lotus was hard hitting even back in the source material. My favorite part, as weird as it is, is just Lee doing the initial punch to the opponent's back. There's so much speed and power behind that using slow down anime lights. It portrays the power it seems like it has. Lee, you might not have bested Gara, but you bested our hearts with this shit. Eight tri -bats. two calls, four calls, eight calls, sixteen calls, thirty-two calls. Eight tri -grams, sixty-four calls. Okay, so speaking for all my fellow Neji fans. The fact that 64 pounds was expanded with so many different strikes is really fun to watch. Cross-referencing the attacks in this show, this is so much different than anything done with the attack before, but far be it for me to complain. The first few hits are about the same, but then the opponent starts bouncing everywhere. Neji bends and contorts in so many ways, but the impact is consistent throughout and it lasts until a devastating blow at the end. The best part is, most of this is still intact in all future iterations of Storm. Even if I do personally prefer 8 Gates Assault, this is just... Damn. Sukuyomi, roam your nightmares for 72 hours. I honestly don't think there's ever been a prettier Ultimate Jutsu in a Naruto game than this. Hell, this still holds up well today for being something from 2008. It's a lot to unpack here, so let's get started. The initial shock colors of Itachi and the world around being activated by the Genjutsu, the opponent being stuck in something akin to the Eclipse from Berserk, the goddamn meteor overhead, and the transition of the meteor turning back into Itachi's eye at the end? Wow, this shit's spectacular. Editor's note. Upon getting into Berserk, I'm pretty sure this really is supposed to be a reference to the Eclipse. This is all before we learn details of Itachi's strengths, by the way. And really helped to remind us of the spectacles we could have gotten from this man having more fights instead of Genjutsus. Oh, I know about a third of you are about to flip your shit from this only being number two. At least this is only one rank off from being number one, and the top pick is just too fun to not have been there. Anyway, Sage Power is a masterclass in taking elements of a character and spinning them, yeah, into a brutal and memorable super attack. We have the initial incineration of the opponent for a Dragon Flame Bomb, 
followed nicely by a Rasengan that tears into them, combusting into a fireball Rasengan that erupts into a fucking fire tornado. One small detail I do love is that if you look closely, you can see the poor sap spitting out inside the inferno. I feel like this one doesn't need much justification, save for mentioning that the attack might be sadly the best thing to happen to Dry ever in a Storm game. But we do have one more entry, so let's hit it. How do we live in a world where both Omega 2040 and Josh Scorcher have never put up this behemoth on a countdown? Hell, my first time seeing this, I was blown away by how fucking good it is and never seeing it sooner. Every single impact guy does under 8 gates looks like he's threatening to rip the enemy apart. I'm not talking about story wise, I'm talking about the actual in game model somehow holding together from this. That first clothesline damn near cleaves the opponent's head off. That wind back to the gut punch launches them to the stratosphere and most anime shit you could possibly imagine takes place. The best way I can describe this whole thing to friends is, this attack looks like a straight up studio trigger. I mean look at these explosions and tell me it doesn't remind you of Gurren Logan or Killer Kill to some capacity. And what were we stuck with after this? Morning Peacock. I feel like I'm dying inside. <laughs> 